Hey guys, this is Eckhart Slaughter. Hello and welcome to another video. Today we'll be talking about the Scorpionek Annihilator droid. And all I'll say is this, if you don't know why I'm talking about this specifically today, maybe come back and watch this video later. Consider that a general spoiler warning. If I go any deeper into that, well, I'll be spoiling it. All right, so the Scorpionek Annihilator droid originated in concept art from Attack of the Clones. The art book says specifically that the Annihilator droid was envisioned as a next generation battle droid. Its appearance harkened back not only to Scorpions, hence the name, but also the destroyer droid from episode one. And we can see that there's very little variation, except perhaps in size, from what the Annihilator droid looked like in concept art to its on-screen screen and originally on page appearance. I say originally on page because until the book of Boba Fett, the Annihilator droid never appeared on screen. I actually thought it had appeared in the Clone Wars, but it actually wasn't even canon until now. I was surprised honestly because it's such an interesting design and one that's very popular in Star Wars fandom as well. But let's take an actual look at the droid specifications and its lore. The Scorpionek Annihilator was created by the Colicoid Creation Nest. This was, unsurprisingly, the same faction which designed and produce the droidica. In fact, for the Clone Wars, one of the Annihilator's most prominent roles was actually the defense of Colophor and its droid foundries, as the Colicoids were pumping out new droid variants for the CIS during the war. The Annihilator was actually somewhat of a departure from the Destroyer droid. The Destroyer was seen somewhat as an almost underling droid model. The Ika in Droidica refers to the word for drone in the Colicoid language. As we see in The Phantom Menace, individual Destroyer droids didn't even have their own intelligence matrixes. The Annihilator, however, was a large, independently operating droid, which could dominate the battlefield through its incredible deadliness, but also independence and intelligence. Another difference between the Destroyer and the Annihilator was the fact that the Annihilator was initially at least kept secret, serving again largely in a planetary defense role. Upon initially discovering the Annihilator droid, one ARC trooper who had been a part of a strike on Call of Four is quoted as saying in the New Essential Guide to Droids, we don't know what it was, sir, but it took out three platoons. We can't let the Colicoids get these things off planet. Let's talk about specifications, and the Annihilator droid is very upfront about what it's packing. We see that it has double laser cannons on each arm. These most likely have variable fire modes for quick bursts or more powerful single shots. However, these are primarily anti-vehicle units, and although the large guns are technically rapid fire, they're not ideal for fighting off infantry. Often large tanks or walkers will have smaller anti-personnel lasers somewhere on their body. I think the Scorpionek's lack of those is a mistake. Because of its height and lack of speed and mobility, at least compared to a trooper, it is somewhat vulnerable to infantry. That being said, the CIS could easily make up for this by pairing it with battle droids or other light vehicles. Interestingly, the Annihilator did have a very unique method of protecting its allies. We see in the Book of Boba Fett that it has a very powerful shield, and that's accurate as well to Star Wars Legends. The Annihilator had both a particle and a ray shield, so it had full protection while the shield was up against energy and projectile weapons. It was able to fire to the shield through what the new essential guide to droids called a unique polarization signature. Anyway, in the midst of battle, annihilator droids would often be deployed alongside destroyers. The destroyers would sit within the shield of the annihilator and also within their own shields, so they would have an exceptional level of protection while also making up for some of the annihilator's weak spots. The shield was perhaps one of the strongest ever mounted on a droid, which which led partially to the Annihilator's extreme cost, which we'll talk about in a moment, but also its effectiveness. The Annihilator saw limited use throughout the Clone Wars, but where it was deployed, the CIS almost always saw victory. We've talked about the Battle of Cola 4. There, Annihilator droids were able to defend against four platoons of clones. That's a full company's worth 144 troopers, while eliminating over three quarters of them. According to the new essential guide to droids, Annihilators turned the tide at the battles of Polani and Formos, and just generally through their extreme power and effectiveness were very difficult for the Republic to handle, disrupting their battle plans. According to that same source, a single Annihilator could destroy a dozen ATTEs, and generally the only way the Republic could be successful is through the committing of an unacceptable number of heavy units. And again, that's a direct quote, meaning that the mere presence of one of these things on the battlefield disrupted Republic operations. Unfortunately, the Annihilator was prohibitively expensive to build. The Annihilator really has three or four key components, which itself were probably multiple times more expensive 
aggressive than other advanced battle droids. The Annihilator's Eye, which unsurprisingly is also a weak spot and is extremely susceptible to damage, contains a variety of advanced sensors, which were actually particularly effective against organic beings. The eye was based off a sensory organ, by the way, of the Colocoids. The shield generator as well would have been very, very expensive, most likely starfighter quality or above, but what's really impressive is that the droid was even able to power the shield and the weapons at the same time. You see those things that almost look like belts running behind the weapons of the Annihilator droid? Those are plasma feed lines providing energy for the continual fire that the weapon is capable of, so presumably the generator is somewhere maybe behind the eye. It's obviously very miniaturized, speaking to the quality of the tech at play here. Anyway, because of the cost, Annihilator droids were never produced in mass quantities. There were about a hundred stationed on Cola 4 for defensive purposes with other units rarely being sent off to the front lines. Palpatine himself was seemingly impressed by the Annihilator droid because at the end of the Clone Wars, and through the use of the shutdown switch, deactivated Annihilator droids were taken by the Imperial Department of Military Research for study, and according to the new essential guide to droids again, many found their way to Palpatine's private citadel on the deep core world of Biss. That last sentence is particularly interesting to me because it implies that Annihilator droids may have somewhat influenced the technology fielded by the Dark Empire, which was the faction in Star Wars Legends that emerged when Palpatine was reborn. I actually think that makes total sense. The Dark Empire relied heavily on mechanized infantry and automated armor. The X-1 Viper, like the Annihilator, relied on an extremely potent shield and was also king of the battlefield, seen as nearly indestructible. The Shadow Droid as well, I think, has some obvious visual similarities to the Scorponek, although in real-world terms, that is definitely a coincidence. Either way, Palpatine did make an obvious shift away from manned heavy armor like the at, -AT to not only mechanized infantry and armor, but autonomous droid-based armor as well. But guys, that's all I have for this video. I hope you enjoyed my breakdown of the Scorponek Annihilator droid. It was really awesome to see this thing reappear in the Book of Boba Fett. Again, I was really surprised it hadn't made its way to canon. And in hindsight, I guess it's obvious that it didn't appear in the Clone Wars, but it's such a almost ubiquitous design that I thought it had. Anyway, I will be talking more about the Book of Boba Fett tonight for Tapcaf Transmissions. You can watch it probably on my channel. I might stream it, but definitely on Corey's. And if you'd rather listen to the podcast version, you can look up Tap calf transmissions on your favorite podcast service and listen there. Anyway, until next time, guys, be safe, have a good one, and may the force be with you.